my mom said that I, she actually said that I was forever changed. Like she said, something happened to my spirit as a child because of the way I was treated in kindergarten. And um, I don't know, when I think of that, it really makes me sad because, you know, here you are, you're a five-year-old kid. And even though I knew I was adopted, I knew I was born in Korea, I knew that I was kind of special. I didn't know that that specialness was negative, you know, in the eyes of other kids. Hi, um, this evening your Asian um, anchor uh, mentioned something about being Asian and Asian people eat dumplings on New Year's Day. I ate dumpling soup. That's what a lot of Korean people do. She was being very Asian and, I don't know, uh, she can keep her Korean um, to herself. I know, you know, it's unfortunate, but when you have conversations with people of color in the United States, many of them have stories of like the first time that we were made to realize we were different, right? And so I wonder if you have one of those stories where you were just a kid and then someone, you know, made it a point to let you know that you're different. My mom stayed at home and then I went to kindergarten and I got made fun of the very first day. I totally remember this. Um, some kid did the eyes, you know, and made fun of me. And for some reason was like, um, kind of like following me around the playground. And I remember I was on this spinny thing. What is that thing called? I forgot the merry-go-round. I did it so fast that I got sick and threw up. So that's what I remember about my first day of kindergarten was this kid was making fun of me and then spun me around so fast that I threw up. But I remember being like, what was that? But in high school, it was like, um, parents were terrible to me. Um, this guy that I had dated wanted, his, his dad told him that he wanted to break up with me because if we ended up together, we would have half free. Those were his words. Um, I was in college and I got chased um, in a parking lot and some woman was like, you know, open your squinty little eyes and learn how to drive. Um, I had also in, uh, when I started working in news, you know, you're working in small markets. And so people would call and complain. Um, one woman called and complained and said that they needed to get that, you know, that, well, they use, the word Jap. They said, get that damn Jap off TV. It's so inappropriate. It's so disrespectful that you would have her at a Memorial Day ceremony. And um, I was, you know, well, I'm not Japanese, first of all. And I was so humiliated because I thought like, if viewers keep complaining like this, am I going to lose my job? When people keep telling you that you don't matter, um, you really start believing that you don't matter. Show of force in Queens. Hundreds of New Yorkers gathering to take part in a rally against hate crimes targeting Asian Americans. Today's rally turned into a march from Flushing Town Hall to a bakery where an Asian woman was attacked earlier this year. The interesting thing about anti-Asian racism and violence is that we can go along for huge stretches of time and it would have seemed that um, we've made it into the mainstream with the model minority we're successful we get into colleges and then something will happen like this that will um, cause this sort of undercurrent of anti-asian racism to explode so the pandemic happens and stop aapi hate becomes a predominant news headline right and you're in the news and i'm sure you're reading the stories what was your initial thought was it it's about time or was it wow i'm shocked that people are finally talking about this as much as they should have been all along it's impressive to me that people haven't realized that things have been difficult for asian people asian americans and native hawaiians and pacific islanders from really the beginning of time when you're looking at history and you can actually look at the exclusion law or you can look at, um, you know, the internment. I mean, Asian Americans have always been discriminated against. And I think about the way I was treated as a child um, and in my adolescence and in my college years, in my early adulthood. I mean, 
when I look back and, and share some of my experiences with people, people are always like, wow, that happened to you? Like, that's terrible. You know, at the same time, I had really, a really great childhood and great experiences too, but I mean, racism and discrimination have always been a part of my life. 42 years in this body has absorbed 42 years of racism, discrimination, and at times, actual violence. And to think some people lose their lives simply because a racist is annoyed that they exist. You listen to this voice, Bail. What's your initial reaction? You know, you ride a roller coaster of emotions. So the first one was shock, like, what in the world, you know? Um, but then it just started getting really heavy. Like, I started, um, like, going back to my childhood, you know, of, like, all these things that people have yeah. said to me. Um, so when I got the voicemail, I just felt like, is this the, is this my life now? Like, am I just gonna, you know, deal with this? And is my son gonna be like this, uh, be in this environment? What did you need in those moments after you went through traumatizing racist incidents like that, that you didn't get, that you're trying to provide to your son out of fear that he may experience those things too? I think, you know, the confidence of saying like, no, that wasn't right um, and following up on it. And uh, I just think that my parents thought it was a losing battle when they were, you know, raising me. And it may, it may have been. Maybe they thought it was going to be too much um, trouble for them to keep following up and it would make it harder on me, you know, I'm not really sure. But, um, but I definitely think that um, having more confidence uh, as an adult to say this is wrong. It was I'm less about sure. the outcome and more about like the fight to validate your experience. Yeah, right, right. When I was growing up, we weren't really proud of our culture. I'm sorry, sorry to say this. It wasn't like cool to be Asian. And it makes me really happy to see how young people experience this differently. It makes me happy for my kids, but it wasn't like that. It was just, we were just like kung fu artists or like there was one um, person who was a news anchor but we were just really invisible so to see the kind of pride people take in their communities and their culture is just i'm really sorry i didn't want to get upset but it's really beautiful and i'm, I'm so happy to see it what gives you hope like what gives what gets you out of the bed every morning? What made you the day that everything happened with this uh, New Year's Day story? What made you go? I I'm gonna put me in there. Like why continue to fight? Why continue to put a smile on? Why have hope that your son can have better experiences in this country than you did? I think it's really easy. I think you just said it. It's my son. I really think about my son and think about like I want him to just love himself, you know? And so when the variation hashtag became like this movement, I really felt like it was this collective idea of let's love ourselves. Like let's love ourselves and be confident who we are. When I see someone like my son, when I see the future generation and how bright and intelligent and hopeful they are, um, I think like this is worth fighting for you know this is definitely worth having conversations for and this is definitely um worth bringing my vulnerabilities out into the rest of the world if it makes a difference for the next generation